welcome everyone for being here. It's really terrific to come together and uh, at least virtually with uh, colleagues and friends and people who are interested in what social science has to offer. It really helps us uh, to keep going even during extremely difficult times. Special thanks to Margit Feischmidt and Attila Pop, of course. And um, thanks to Rogers Brubaker for writing another thought-provoking critical analysis that pushes boundaries and um, pushes us to revisit uh, the way we think about popularly used big concepts of analysis. And in this case, and of course, his, his talk and the paper that um, he sent us, which is, which is a draft that I hope in a finalized form will be published soon, um, has so much um, that can be unpacked and there is limited time. So here I will actually, I will focus on, on two things. The first one is the question of how um, Rogers is, um, um, analysis challenges us, what it tells us about how we can use populism to analyze what goes on, the protests today, and, and generally about, about anti-establishment, anti-elite uh, discourse and um, uh, stances. So the big concept that, that we are working with here is populism, which has emerged as one of the most popular concepts out there today, which, you know, pun intended, it's a popular, populism is a popular concept. But it is understandable, of course, because, because we see um, popular challenges to expertise and elites and establishment everywhere. And we live in a period of growth for thinking about and writing about populism. And in recent years, there have been there has been an increase in, in really interesting articles about uh, various types of populism with adjectives, nationalist populism, anti-corruption populism. Um, and there are some typologies coming out also that are offering more adjectives to, uh, to populism, anti-establishment populism, which it seems almost like all populism is anti-establishment anti-expert populism and, and so on. So the, these show a need for people who are working within this framework to, to say something, to, to create a set of uh, concepts that can make populism more helpful for us for analyzing what goes on around us. And the, the pandemic has certainly created an extremely challenging environment in which we are trying to make sense of the world and think about what concepts we can use to analyze and how. So uh, Rogers' analysis takes account of whether the protests that are taking place in the US show us anything significantly novel about populism. And he acknowledges that Populism is only one way of thinking about these protests analytically. And he does not claim that it's the best way. He also clarifies that he uses populism in a very abstract sense for a discursive and stylistic repertoire without associating this repertoire to any particular speaker, any particular type of, of speaker, uh, political leaders or journalists or activists on the street or social media actors. It's also important that he focuses on anti-restriction protests, although there are a few observations uh, about the uh, Black Lives Matter protests, but the analytical focus is on anti-restriction protests. So these protests obviously can be analyzed as populist because they are anti-establishment, anti-elite. But the point here, the larger point for us as people who are trying to create expertise about what goes on is, is the question of how, how can we then use populism to understand them? And Brubaker's analysis is convincing in the way he sets up three ways in which these anti-establishment protests might appear as though they challenged conventional thinking about populism the, the three paradoxes, expertise and crisis and protectionism. Then it 
tells us how at least two of the three are not really paradoxical, but they can be explained in the mainstream populism framework. And the third one, the paradox of protectionism, may be paradoxical, but the conclusion is somewhat tentative on it. So the answer emerging to the question of whether these protests are showing something significantly novel about populism is not positive. Uh, the conceptual takeaway essentially reaffirms that the basic features of populism on which there has been pretty broad consensus in the literature so far, namely that it does not offer a substantive political ideology, but it is an oppositional stance. It's anti-elite and anti-establishment. These basic features are what we have to work with. And then the content of what populism here and there in different settings does is contingent upon specific circumstances. So this aligns with the way many social scientists experts have been talking about, about populism and it is convincing but it does leave open a question about how populism as an analytical framework can then be used for the analysis of anti-establishment stances and so i'm thinking that if all that populism provides us is to see the anti-establishment and anti-elite dimensions of protest then we do need to ask ourselves how useful it will be for us in comparison with other analytical frameworks. And there are alternatives in the literature on contentious politics. There's other literature on protests, literature on revolutions, literature on various forms of political opposition that are also theorizing and, and offering concepts. And, so I'm thinking if we were to analyze these current protests 10 years from now with the benefit of some hindsight at the time, would we be analyzing them within a populism framework, which by then might be better developed, or would we find more analytical support in other conceptual frameworks in the literature and contentious politics, which are also developing? So that's the first, that's the, that's the, the, the question which is i realize not entirely a fair question in the sense that rogers did say that he did not think populism was the best way to analyze but i think it still raises this question if the conclusion is that what populism can tell us is that these are anti-establishment and anti-elite then then okay so so what next now the second thing i'd like to to talk about is has to do with um how we, what, what's offered, the concepts offered in this analysis um, might help us to understand these protests from the perspective of minority political agency. And so I'm not focused here on, on discourse or anything. I'm focused on the question of agency. And just briefly, let me tell you why I think we should be interested in minority political agency in the context of populism. And it's because most state governments around the world are trying to create majoritarian nation states, and those who do not belong to the majoritarian part of the project become minority members. And in most cases, minority members also become structurally disadvantaged. So, the establishments against which anti-establishment protests are taking place in many cases um, appeal or at least it is reasonably expected that minority actors might find appealing anti-establishment frameworks and so the question of course is whether minority actors that might initiate or participate in anti-establishment uh, protests have a role in, in, in actually achieving anything, in even shaping anti-establishment protests. So agency, I believe, is an important aspect that needs to be examined. And it seems from the literature on, on various forms of, of minority contestation that in majoritarian states, minorities usually can achieve something, some change, systemic change, or even minor policy change only with the help of majority allies. 
And so it's really interesting and exciting um, in the protests, in the Black Lives Matter protests that are taking place in the US today, is that there is an increase in majority allies that this wave is bringing in a lot of people who are not necessarily themselves identifying as members of minority populations, but are joining the protests. So it seems that the COVID crisis, to, to bring it back to the, back, to, this, to the backdrop of the crisis, that the COVID crisis has generally highlighted systemic disadvantages extremely well, the systemic disadvantages that affect minority members, not only in the US, but also in Canada and other parts of the world, including Hungary. I participated a couple of days ago on a, um, I mean, I, I listened into an excellent seminar on the various ways in which different minority uh, members in Hungary are affected. And so the Black Lives Matter protests emerged against this background, although they were triggered by one specific event, a video about the killing of George Floyd, a black man by a policeman in Minneapolis. The anger and frustration expressed in this protest reveals something deeply flawed in the establishment, something generated by longstanding systemic racism against blacks. But there are other, of course, other racialized minorities that are routinely affected by it. Hispanics, indigenous people, people with Asian features, nowadays. And so from the Brubaker account, I've selected three concepts that I find useful for analyzing how minority political agency features in these Black Lives Matter protests. And I selected one from each of the three paradoxes that he's talking about. So regarding the use of expertise, I find the concept of participatory expertise relevant and helpful. Uh, Brubaker talks about a gap between local experience and abstract knowledge, and this, of course, is relevant to both anti-restriction protesters and BLM protesters, Black Lives Matter protesters. But for marginalized minorities, this is an oversized gap that is systematically reproduced due to lack of equal access to institutions of education, public health, housing, the labor market, everything not to mention the justice system, the way minority members experience police brutality, legal protection in courts, treatment in prisons, and so on. And so the call for participatory expertise has actually become prominent in BLM protests. Black activists are pressing for inclusion in decision-making, in having a voice, not only a voice in expressing frustration, but also an impact on the course of change on transforming institutions. So if anti-restriction protesters say something like, don't tell us you big city people how to distance ourselves physically here because our communities are safer, there aren't any cases, you have no right to close our local economies, then Black Lives Matter protesters are saying, you need to include us in decision-making about the rules by which we live. We want to be there at the federal, state, and local levels, and you need to take our experiences into consideration. So that's a different way of talking about using participatory expertise. Second, regarding the use of crisis, clearly Black Lives Matter protests highlight crisis, and they're not interested in uh, performing normality. So here, the trajectories of anti-restriction protesters on the one side and BLM protesters on the other diverge even more. Anti-restriction protesters may be performing normality, pretending that the virus doesn't change much, it's like a season of flu and so on, but BLM protesters do not want to go back to normality. They want to transform normality. They find the uh, going back to normality talk uh, damaging, misleading, and dangerous, actually. And the support behind this intent is growing, it's unprecedented, it's historic in, in the way it brings in majority allies. Third, regarding the use of protectionism, and here too, the trajectories uh, of anti-restriction uh, protesters and BLM protesters diverge substantively. Anti-restriction protesters may be against the nanny state for libertarian reasons, but 
BLM protesters want protection against police br brutality. They want government to be, uh, not to retreat, but to transform itself so it protects black lives and gives them equal life chances in a all, literal and all kinds of ways. And they want fundamental systemic changes, not only in law enforcement, but throughout the institution structures and so on. So um, overall, I'm in agreement with Rogers on the need for us to continue reassessing our analytical tools. I'm convinced that populism can be helpful, but I'm not yet convinced that at this point it offers the best tools for analyzing this protest, particularly for those who are interested not only in the discursive aspects, but also in the agency of actors. And I do want to add that nonetheless, even a Brubaker paper that does not advocate for the populism which offers some helpful analytical concepts and pushes us to think more about expertise. Thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, I would like also thank the organizers for uh, putting together this uh, exciting event and, and for having invited such a great speaker line as Rogers and Zhuzha. Uh, I'm not sure that I, I, I fit uh, into this line, but I will try to do my best to, to, to make some, some comments on, on Rogers. Very inspiring and very interesting talk. Um, uh, of course, I, I cannot disagree with, with him, and I think that these, these uh, problems or, 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 or what he calls paradoxes about expertise crisis and protectionism are, are really important in, in the populist discourse, and I think it really helps us to, to better understand what's going on. What I would like to do is uh, <clears throat> first uh, to bring in some more details, uh, especially from Europe, um, to make the picture a little bit even more uh, complex and, and less evident. And, and also, I would like to a little bit turn the tables because, uh, well, Roger, Roger seemed to, uh, uh, seems to, to, to express some, some concern about populism. Uh, I'm quoting him, uh, populism uh, has heightened distrust of expertise, exacerbated antipathy to government regulation, and amplify skepticism toward elite overprotectiveness. And it seems that it, it's, it's kind of dangerous uh, mix that, that, that can, <clears throat> that can over, overtake uh, public discourses and, and, and politics. Uh, of course, it may happen, and, and we don't know about the future. What I would like to, to uh, uh, underscore here is that these paradoxes that he, I think, very uh, nicely identified uh, are, are also challenges, challenges to, to populism and populists. Um, uh, so, so let me explain myself. Uh, I, I, yeah, I one, one more thing. So, so Rajas was, was talking mostly about uh, the discourse of populism. Uh, in general, I will, I will focus more on what Juja called agency. So I, 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 will, I will focus more on populist actors uh, just for the sake of simplicity, because uh, I don't have data on, on, on populist discourses on social media, for instance, but I have some knowledge about what uh, uh, parties or politicians, uh, which are usually labeled as populist, uh, have said or, or, or have done in, in, in these uh, uh, times of, of the pandemic. So, so let me focus for, first on, on, on the question of, or the paradox, as, as Roger has put it, of expertise. Um, so Rajas is, is suggesting that, that, that uh, expertise is somehow effectively questioned by populism. Again, as, as he said, uh, distrust is, is fueled by, by, by populism toward expertise. Of course, it, it may be so, but I think that, that uh, the, in these times when, when expertise is indeed important, this is also a challenge for, for populists. And actually some populist actors were uh, criticizing the governments for, for not uh, taking the, the pandemic seriously enough and, and, and not uh, 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 bringing in strict uh, measures. Uh, let me just uh, uh, refer to Hert Wilders, for instance, the leader of the Dutch Freedom Party, who was, was even referring to the World Health Organization. Can, can you imagine that a populist politician is referring to international organi organizations and the experts of the WHO? and criticizing the, uh, his government from, from this perspective. 
but also in Belgium or in France, uh, um, uh, Populist parties have been criticizing the, the government. Or let me, or let me uh, point to uh, the Greek case, where Syriza, the left uh, populist party, actually endorsed the government policy for for nominating Professor Tsiodras as the the main uh, uh, medical expert of of the government. You know, saying that he's a great expert, and if we were in in power, we would do the same, etc. So, so Syriza again. Uh, uphold the case for 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 expertise. So uh, I think that that uh, expertise is a challenge in, in in those times. And 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 while populists are believed to be anti technocrats, uh, and and I think generally they are, but in those times sometimes they they, they acknowledge expertise and they even use this kind of discourse, expert discourse, uh, in order to criticize uh, uh, those in, those in power. But at the same time, I think that that uh, it's not so simple because again, populism is a, is a very multifaceted and malleable concept, and and it's very 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 difficult to say any general about populism, of course. So, for instance, coming back to the French uh, populists, why they were criticizing the EU government, uh, both uh, Mélenchon and Marine Le Pen, so the left and the right uh, French populists, uh, they were supporting the the the, the French doctor. Who popularized the idea that that chloroquine might be a, a potent cure for for the disease? You know the the, the very same chloroquine that after was uh, also embraced by by Donald Trump, uh, and actually they did it in a very populist way, uh, portraying the doctor as a as a victim of of mainstream medical uh, uh, lobbies or, or mainstream medical science, etc. Uh, Mélenchon also criticized the, the omniscience of experts and, and so on and so forth. So, so of course, this kind of anti-expertise and, and, and this populist uh, um, uh, discourses is, are also there. Or let me give the Hungarian example. So actually, it turns out that the Hungarian government was relying on, a, on, on an expert team uh, made up by mathematicians, uh, biologists, epidemiologists, etc. But very strangely, I mean, this team of, of experts were practically hidden from the, from the public. I mean, uh, Orban Viktor, the, the prime minister, has been very active in communicating with the public. There were daily uh, press conferences also by the, the task force, where we, we, we could also see at least two men in uniform, you know, soldiers, uh, policemen, etc. Uh, but those experts were, were, were not really referred to. The government didn't legitimize uh, its decision with, with, with its expertise. Those uh, uh, highly competent experts on, on epidemiology, they were not in the public discourse. So again, this is a kind of strange that, that the Hungarian leader, uh, who is a, 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 a uh, self-identified populist, actually, uh, he was relying on expertise, but at, at the same time, he, he, he didn't mention it publicly. So somehow, uh, a kind of paradoxical relationship to that expertise. So I think that, that um, to, to uh, put it in a more provocative way, I think that populists are struggling with this uh, expertise challenge. Uh, they are they are they are trying to 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 remain populist while at the same time of course they have to acknowledge that we live in times when experts are are important um a little bit um uh, i can say similar things about about the crisis um i think in 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 europe a lot of populist actors actually didn't uh, downplay the 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 crisis not even the medical crisis as i said several populist parties criticized their own government saying that no you should do more and people should be protected etc um uh, but at the same time it is is also true that that of course i am i i am not uh, i i agree with with rogers that the populists try to, to uh, capitalize on the social and economic crisis, absolutely so. Um, and, and it is also true that, that uh, somehow populists were, were, were hesitant in, in many times. A good example is Salvini in Italy. Salvini uh, somehow couldn't decide whether to criticize for the, the government for not being strict enough or, or criticize the government for, 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 for the too strict a lockdown, you know, so kind of, he was uh, vacillating in a sense between the between the two uh, uh, two positions 
or I was referring to Herd Wilders in, in the Netherlands, but, but he changed his position. First, he was criticizing very much his government, even uh, referring to international expertise. But later in April, he became more and more uh, liberal or libertarian and saying that now the lockdown is too much and, and we have to, to ease the lockdown, etc. So, so this is true that again, my, my point is, or my, um, my, I don't know what is it, assumption or hypothesis or just uh, idea that, that again, populists are struggling with this crisis because this crisis is, is an objective crisis as you nicely put it in your paper. Uh, uh, they didn't uh, uh, made it up, they didn't construct it, they, didn't, they, they don't master it in a sense. Uh, and, and they are, they are uh, searching for ways to, 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 to dominate this crisis, to use it. And, and sometimes they are of course uh, very efficient uh, um, uh, not, not always so, of course, not always so. Um, uh, one more thing I wanted to say about the crisis um, is that, um, sorry, I forgot what I, what I really wanted to say. Um, yes, yeah, 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 just, just a, a minor remark that, that it, it's, not, it's not even dependent whether you are in, in opposition or, in, or, in, uh, or in, in the government, because of course, uh, Opposition parties, the, the uh, opposition um, populist parties are criticizing the government, of course, and, and are, are maybe even overemphasizing the crisis. But for instance, Podemos in, in Spain, which is in government, they use very uh, effectively the crisis to, to advance its own political agenda. And, and in Spain, the nationalization of private hospital happened, which, which, is, which is a, a victory for, for Podemos. Um, uh, yeah, and, and one more thing that, again, coming back to Hungary, so, so what we can see in Hungary that is that the, the, the pet crisis of the government is, of course, the immigration crisis. And in the beginning of the, the pandemic, the government tried to, to use the, the frame of immigration crisis, you know, that the, the, the disease was spread by Iranian students and foreigners, etc just like Salvini in Italy and other uh, populists also tried to, to link uh, the pandemic to, to immigration. But af after, of course, when the, when, the, when the pandemic unfolded, this immigration discourse somehow uh, was a little bit put aside. But now that, that, that the, the communication of the government is that the, uh, the epidemic is under control, what we can experience is that this immigration discourse and the discourse about the immigration crisis is coming back. Uh, again, this is a crisis what, what, what the government uh, uh, is mastering and, and, uh, and this is day crisis and, and uh, apparently they feel more comfortable in day crisis than in a crisis which, which, which were given to them by, 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 uh, by the outside. Okay, and, and, and the last thing, this protectionism, I think it's also very interesting and, and it's a good point. Uh, uh, of course, maybe it, uh, this debate might be more uh, heated in, in the US where, where this libertarian populism is, is much more widespread than in, that in Europe, I mean, the Tea Party and the, this kind of approaches. But it is, it is uh, even in Europe, it's, it's true that, that populists uh, have been struggling with this issue. On, on one hand, of course, the, this whole pandemic gives a, a, a leverage to, to anti-globalization discourse uh, even anti-EU discourse and these protectionist measures and closing the frontiers, etc., the borders. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we can also see in Europe that, that some populist actors all of a sudden are criticizing their gov the, the own government for being too authoritarian, like in Germany, for instance, the, 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 the AFD is now a, a great defendant of, of, of individual liberties against the German government. Uh, the same in Spain uh, with the Vox, the, the, the right-wing uh, populist party, uh, or uh, Mélenchon in France who said that uh, uh, there is a danger of, of the lockdown of democracy. So, so I think that, that, that you are right, that, that, that populists again are, are, are struggling between this protectionist discourse, which, uh, which refers mostly to international protectionism, of course, and anti-protectionist discourse, when it comes to, to individuals or communities. And again, I would, I would uh, uh, emphasize a little bit uh, the, the nature of the, the challenge in this. So, so I, I think, and I agree with you that there is no coherent populist discourse and populists are struggling find, finding, to find the, 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 the right words and the right discourse to, to somehow uh, 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 balance these uh, maybe conflictual 
claims and, and, and conflictual arguments. So um, all I want uh, to say, um, <clears throat> I believe, is, uh, is that, uh, that uh, uh, you may be right for, for the future and, and this uh, popular discontent and these uh, populist discourses about uh, science and crisis, etc., may become very powerful. So there is, there is, of course, a danger. But for the time being, I think that the populists uh, have struggled with this situation. If, if you look at polls, for instance, the popularity of, of populist parties have not been soaring or is not soaring, generally speaking. Of course, there are differences. We cannot say that this pandemic would have swept away populism. Of course, it's, it's certainly not the, not, the, not, the, not the case. But I also think that, that populists, populists so far couldn't really capitalize on this situation. Again, maybe they will be more successful in the future, but uh, for the time being, I think that these problems, these paradoxes, as you put it, uh, are also challenges for them. So thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Zsuzsa and, and Joel. These are really terrific, um, terrific uh, sets of comments and questions and observations. Um, I very much appreciate them. Uh, I uh, am, of course, when I was working on this subject, I'm, I'm doing so from a very American um, uh, uh, context. Uh, uh, so I am quite aware of the distinctiveness of the of the American landscape, both for historical reasons, because of distinctive aspects of the of the U.S. and so on, but also because of the distinctive way in which the U.S. has experienced the pandemic, given our particular political constellation and our federal structure and the huge country with so many differences and so on. But also then because of the distinctive intertwining to come to some of Zhuzhou's points of the way in which then the pandemic has been intertwined with um, the Black Lives Matter protests and so on. So in, in all of these respects, the U.S. Um, experience is, is very different. So I'm very appreciative to Jolt for, for bringing in some European perspectives, noting some ways in which certain aspects of this resonate, but also um, ways in which the European experience, and of course there is no single European experience, but the various European experiences are, are quite different. Um, and I, I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing, I, I've been writing this, this paper, um, uh, as it were, from two perspectives, from two standpoints myself. Um, on the one hand, from the standpoint of someone who has worked a lot on populism in recent years and, and, and written, you know, tried to come to grips myself with what Zhuzha uh, rightly characterizes as a very, very slippery um, uh, concept, a, a concept that has the, the concept that has been called into question by almost everybody who's worked on populism. Almost everybody um, has noted that the concept is so slippery, so heterogeneous, used in so many different ways. Maybe we should throw it out altogether. The kinds of questions that Zhuzha raised about its analytical usefulness have been raised um, again and again in the literature. You know, is and I, I raised them myself in in other work on on populism. Can we, you know, this concept, which is so slippery, which is also used um, as a category of practice, used in practice to denounce, to stigmatize, uh, uh, yes, occasionally embraced in practice, uh, say, yes, I am a populist, I own it, but more often in the literature, uh, the scholarly literature, as well as the journalistic literature, used to stigmatize, to challenge. Can such a concept um, be used as an analytical concept? Does it give us any leverage? Of course, that depends on the questions we ask. So I appreciate Zhuzha raising those, those questions. So let me, um, you know, without trying to be exhaustive, let me touch on some of the issues raised by, by Zhuzha and, and, and Jolt. Um, Zhuzha wonders, among other things, you know, whether the current moment reveals anything kind of new about populism, a new form of populism. I don't know, and I don't, I don't claim that it does, and I don't think that it does. What I, I, what I think that it does is prompt us to offer a somewhat more nuanced characterization of certain things that we already knew about populism. Um, uh, in particular, a more nuanced characterization of the relation to populism as ex and, and, and relation of populism to expertise, 
This has been a big theme in the literature on, on populism. Um, sometimes it's put in way too simple a manner as if populism were simply and constitutively anti-expertise. I think as Joltz's comments point out uh, correctly, uh, this is not the case. I mean, it's much more complicated than that, just as almost everything is more complicated, of course. Um, but, you know, in particular in recent years, in the last three or four years, there's been certain literature about post-truth, you know, post-fact, um, uh, populism is just, you know, totally in some different epistemological uh, plane altogether. There was a very interesting article written on what was called epistemological populism, um, making the point that populism is allied with common sense and local experience um, and opposed to abstract and experience distant forms of knowledge privileges the immediate and the concrete. That's true, and I note some ways in which that comes out in the current context, but it's not the whole story, and it's never been the whole story about populism's relation to expertise. As other literature has pointed out, and this is what I want to bring out, you know, the, that relation is always is, is more complex. Populists indeed appeal. They don't simply criticize expertise. They invoke expertise, but they invoke expertise often in a way that um, involves a critique of mainstream expertise or establishment expertise or the limits of expertise or the way in which expertise, uh, you know, it's interesting here, you see a kind of merging of a right wing and a left wing um, critique as you often do in the sphere of populism, a critique of, for example, big pharma and the ways in which knowledge is produced and therefore we can't, you know, partly a political economy critique of, of the pharmaceutical industry, we can't, and this is true in certain segments of the anti-vaccination movement, which we would be wrong to dismiss simply as a bunch of know-nothings who are anti-science and anti-expertise. It's much more complicated than that. These are often very well-educated people um, who live in extremely, who, who live in the prosperous suburbs of Marin County, who read a lot of scientific literature, but who believe somehow that it's their job to be skeptical and to be skeptical precisely of establishment consensuses. Right? So the populist moment here is not an expertise moment per se, but a certain skepticism of anything institutionalized, established, anything too consensual that links up to Jolt's comment about um, the French doctor, I think his name was Roule, if I remember, uh, who fits the mold perfectly of a maverick, right? Who, who's a very credentialed, highly respected, highly published science, but a maverick who sets himself apart from and against the establishment. So the relationship of populism to expertise is complex. Populists invoke expertise, they invoke counter experts. They also claim some, as I said, some kind of lay expertise or participatory expertise and so on. Um, so there's so a way of nuancing the, the literature on, on populism, also nuancing the literature on crisis and protectionism in the sense that too often the performance of crisis um, and a protection stance are taken as kind of constitutive elements of populism. I don't think they're constitutive, they're contingent. What's constitutive, what's always there is the anti-establishment, anti-elite. Now, of course, you may say it's not really anti-establishment, not really anti-elite and so on, but that discourse is always there. That's constitutive. Some construction of the people against the establishment, against the elite. But because this is a relational and oppositional concept, it's a form of anti-ism, as uh, Tagiev pointed out a long time ago, then everything substantive depends on how the establishment is construed at any particular moment. I think this has a lot to do also with the flip-flops that Jolt pointed out, right? Why, why populists are inconsistent, why they shift back and forth. As the landscape shifts, they shift. So Jolt quite rightly points out that the immigration issue comes back now as as there's an opening up, right? For a while, it just wasn't, nobody talked about it because, because the elite and the establishment agreed that borders were closed, right? So there's nothing to say. And so, you know, but now in a moment where there's an opening up, then of course there's, um, you know, a moment to, to, to harp on the immigration theme again. So that, that um, the relational and oppositional nature of populism and it's extreme opportunism because it's not a substantive political ideology, it's free to respond in this fluid way to a changing political context. And that's, I think, you know, so, so, what, so, so uh, 
And so, so yeah, so in this case, because the establishment's in crisis mode, you can perform non-crisis. Of course, only with respect to the medical crisis, while you have your own crises, not only to talk about, but to perform, to enact. Um, uh, so just to Zhuzha's point about the Black Lives Matter um, movement, um, uh, having, you know, not only calling attention to another crisis, but performing crisis, provoking crisis, enacting crisis in the street. This has been, I think, a very helpful um, turn in the populist literature in the last few years, a kind of performative turn here as elsewhere, where there's an emphasis on the performative. So, um, the, the, and so what's curious about the moment is that you have populists not just saying, you know, the elites are exaggerating, they're performing non-crisis in the medical domain, but performing crisis in another domain, just as the Black Lives Matter uh, protesters are perf not, just, not just trying to say, hey, we've got a crisis in our communities, but performing crisis in the streets. Um, uh, yeah, so, and now is, so to, to use this question of, well, you know, how are we going to look at this 10 years later? Is populism really the best analytical optique? Uh, you perfectly char correctly characterize my argument um, that, you know, but, but I, I guess I, the only, you know, I just wouldn't put it in the, you know, is this better than that? You know, there, there are so many questions one can ask about the pandemic that I don't think it's even meaningful to ask, is populism the best, um, analytical language to talk about protest or is something else, you know, contentious politics, whatever. Depends what questions you want to ask. Uh, why I'm interested in politics and pan populism and why I think it does matter in the present is, you know, okay, partly because of my engagement with the populism literature, it's an occasion for me to make some precision, some nuances, but more because I'm an American citizen. And I, we have an election coming up in November. And I'm, I believe that when we look back at this from 10 years from now, or even from six months from now, we will see that populism is a crucial analytical optique. Why? Because I'm afraid that the next months are going to be dominated in part by a, an enormous exercise in the politics of blame. And the politics of blame, which will centrally involve this populist critique of experts, right? And of elite overprotectionism and of a false crisis and so on, I fear as an American citizen, not as a student of populism, but as an American citizen, that this moment will be a moment of the politics of blame in a massively populist mode. That's why I think that the category of populism is analytically uh, relevant here. Very briefly on some of the agency point. Yeah, I mean, both Zhuzha and Jolt, um, you know, you talk, uh, Zhuzha focused on agency, Jolt on agents on parties and leaders and so on. I'm very aware of the kind of oddity that my paper has no agents in it. I mean, it does have some agents, protesters and so on, but I precisely didn't want to talk about, you know, parties and so on. I'm very aware of the, you know, situation of European parties and their, so on. But, but uh, so yes, my, my, I, I was not, but I, so I appreciate the attention to agencies and agents. I, you know, I agree that ultimately, Populism doesn't do anything. Populism is not an entity. Populism is not an actor. I have some, a few phrases in the paper where I say populism does X or think, you know, all of that, of course, is just a shorthand. Populism doesn't do anything. Populism is, a, as I've argued at length in other work, populism is a discursive and stylistic repertoire that people, agents, can draw on in different ways. It's very widely available. It's very well known and so on. So I do appreciate the focus on agency, on the Allies question, yes, very interesting. The, um, uh, the, the, the very um, uh, diverse and heterogeneous crowds who have been in the streets. I think this reflects not only some sharp, um, you know, an ally, bet an alliance between sharply defined minorities and sharply defined majorities. I think one of the features that's been very important in American society in the last 10, 20 years, also in Europe, is the weakening of boundaries. I mean, it's not clear what the majority is. It's not clear what a minority is. We talked a lot of talk in the U.S. about a majority-minority issue. But it's not as if there's a sharp boundary between, you know, a majority and a minority. And, um, you know, the whole, uh, you know, incredible diversification of diversity, what some theorists have called super diversity, and so on, it means that, the, the you know, I, I'm a little skeptical of the sharp majority, you know, major, majority-minority Boundary, I think that, that, but that is what we see in the streets, this incredibly heterogeneous um, uh, 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 coalition. Um, uh, and, and then just very quickly, yes, on uh, you know, you know, participatory expertise, absolutely. 
participatory expertise is not a property sort of a right-wing populist. It's, there's a lot, as I said, the participatory crisis, uh, participatory challenge to expertise is not new. It's been going on for a, a century, at least half a, well, maybe half a century in a very serious way when you started developing critiques of restrictionist, uh, you know, insular science and finding new ways for the community to participate and so on. So, but it's a very ambivalent concept, right? Because participatory, you know, whose experience is going to be validated? Who's, you know, lot, lots of different claims here, you know, look, my experience, your experience, who's, so yes, but participatory expertise is a much, much broader phenomenon, very important, as you rightly say, in the Black Lives Matter context, also important in the COVID uh, context. Okay, Jolt's, I just, I've talked about some of Jolt's um, very helpful uh, comments. Again, I obviously come at this from a very American point of view. Uh, again, yeah, I, I think the fact that some populist parties um, were urging in the beginning, urging stricter action um, is indeed perfect, exactly what one would expect about a relational and oppositional thing, right? At a point when the mainstream elites had not declared crisis, then indeed, um, European populists, including, by the way, also the AfD, the uh, German alternative uh, for Deutschland, was also early on criticizing the government for not doing enough and you should do more. <laughs> so uh, Trump also early on, right-wing supporters of Trump were pressing him to um, uh, uh, close the borders uh, you know, with China at a time when the WHO and progressives and so on didn't want to do that. So it's all relational. It's all oppositional. You see the oppositions that you um, that you you characterize. I mentioned. I think I mentioned already. Um, uh, you know, touched on already uh, most of your your other points. So uh, thank you both um, very very much. We could continue a discussion with with Zhuzha and Jolt. I you know again. So uh, maybe they have comments. I but, but let me let me just yeah I'll say br very briefly just about the Brazilian I'm not a Brazil I, I'm not a Brazil expert of course but I've of course found the Bolsonaro um, phenomenon uh, extremely um, uh, you know interesting um, and uh, uh, because he of course was one of the populists in power who then uh, downplayed uh, the crisis quite consistently um, so but I think what's interesting is that you know Trump has done that to some extent also right sort of oscillating between downplaying the significance and then at, you know Trump has been shifting wildly between downplaying the significance and then saying oh this is terrible and you know Bolsonaro has been more consistent in downplaying the significance so in in doing so he has struck a populist note in a classic way right the I mentioned the gendered um, in imagery and symbolism is very important often in in populist discourse he has been embodying a certain kind of masculinist performance of virility and invulnerability with respect to a uh, virus that he downplays and poo-poo's the safety and so on. But what's interesting is that given Brazil's federal structure, and in this respect, Brazil and the U.S. are again very similarly and interesting, right? So even though Trump and Bolsonaro are incumbents, they can also be in opposition, right? They can be, you know, Bolsonaro has been in opposition to regional governors who have imposed strict measures, and Trump has famously been in opposition to state governors, democratic ones, of course, who have imposed strict lockdown measures. So Trump famously, I can't even remember when it was now, a month or six weeks ago, did his famous tweets, liberate Michigan, liberate Minnesota, or was it Wisconsin, I can't remember, liberate Virginia, you know, from siding with, you know, he's the president of the country, but he acts like he was in opposition, right? And so Bolsonaro, you know, has, has done that that same thing. So let, let me let me stop there. Orban is in opposition with Brussels, you know, so uh, populist leaders somehow <laughs> always find a way to um, to be in opposition. Yes, to be in opposition and also to be in, right, to be, even when they're in power, they want to be in opposition with not only Brussels or something external, but with the elites in their own country whom they still want to cast as powerful and dangerous and whatever. Yes, so Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the fourth question, actually the third, I think I, I, I didn't uh, understand well. Uh, one is um, asking, can you see one way or another parallels in the current U.S. crisis experience 
with 1968. So the comparison yeah. between the current crisis and 1968. Yeah, I mean, I, Margaret, I can see the questions on my screen. So I see the, also the question about, oh. I'm happy to respond to the, the third question as well. The third question was about, and I should say, by the way, that I, I, I thought in the, the second question was, in, I'm sorry, I just don't really have any thoughts on that, on social distance and proximity, how it relates to, of course, the reconfiguration of distance and proximity is a very you know, important part of our experience. And this interests me as a sociologist in the last three months, but I, I guess I would not analyze this from the optique of populism. About the individualism, I think the question was, 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 was uh, posing, well, saying, okay, Americans are very individualistic, and, and, but populism seems somehow to appeal to the people as a collectivity. But I, I do think you see a fusion here in a, in a context, because again, populism is relational and oppositional. And insofar as it construes elites or establishment as being too collectivistic or imposing burdensome regulations or, or so on, then indeed populism can, the, the, the people can be construed as intrinsically you know, individualistic. So it's an individualistic construction of the collectivity of the people. Um, uh, so I think there is, uh, you know, there is an affinity there. 68, well, not for the populism angle, but of course, I think um, everyone um, in the context of the recent um, uh, Black Lives Matter protests, especially in the early days uh, uh, when uh, there were more clashes, uh, when the curfews were imposed and the uh, National Guard was called out, of course, everyone was thinking of 1968 because we had an election in 1968 and Nixon ran as the party of order. And Trump, of course, has been trying to pose as the party of order and you know, arguing for the law, law and order. I think I've been, you know, it's not my area, but I've been persuaded by commentators who have noted the very many differences here. I mean, for starters, it's just, you know, how can the Prince of Chaos pose as the party of order? I mean, the, the, the Republican party is not a party of order and it's a party of chaos and Trump, its head is a, so it's very difficult to kind of say, yes, I represent order when you have been embodying chaos. Um, also, the whole political context is different, and the you know. Uh, uh, so I I I am not I, I am worried about many things. I'm worried about the development of a politics of blame that I just you know mentioned to you. I'm not so worried about um, you know kind of a law and order um, uh, agenda dooming uh, Democrats in 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 November. The candidate of the Democratic Party is uh, very much a figure of order and so on. Uh, I think it would be different if the candidate were, uh, identified, were identified with a different wing of the party. But you know, that particular um, the parallel, uh, I, I think there are a lot of disanalogies as well. Thank you, Rogers. Uh, we have, I just would like to remind, uh, yes, thank you, uh, Shusha to remind uh, our audience that we still have 10 minutes. So if you have any question, comments in your mind, you can write them in the chat uh, space uh, of, your, of your screen. Zuzha has raised her hand. Uh, please uh, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so in the spirit of, of the conversation here, um, I just, I was thinking that, that of all of these expressions of populism with an adjective, I think epistemological populism is going to be very helpful, useful. And I was thinking that um, this, this question of participatory um, um, ex expertise or the question of whether the experts are separate from their subjects, right, has been part of the way we have been trying to construct our expertise in the social sciences. And I've been a Bourdieuian who says that, you know, we have to use categories of, categories of analysis as separate from categories of practice and all that. And I know that Rogers has, uh, has, has been saying that for a long time um, as well. But at the same time, and so in my environment, critical theorists have been always saying that, you know, you, that's not possible, that's not even necessarily always a good thing. So this question of how people who, whom we are talking about, and in our field, of course, in the social sciences, words are our, our tools, our instruments, and words are used by, by everyone else. 
And so what makes us experts on, <laughs> on, on these words, on these terms that we are using to describe things that people actually experience and in many uh, settings experience differently, right? And so I think that there's, there's some work for us to do as well in the social sciences in, in trying to deal with that. And I, I noticed that especially in the Canadian, um, in the Canadian um, setting where there is an effort now to introduce indigeneity into the way we talk about everything. So there is, there is terminology on indigenizing the curricula, indigenizing institutions, indigenizing how we, how we teach and all of that because there is a recognition that this is a settler society. So, so I just wanted to point that out that this is, I mean, it, it's uh, remarkable to notice that in the social science and public health field, but it's something that we've been dealing with for, for longer in the social sciences. So that's one thing. The other thing I wanted to just, just briefly say that I, um, Roger said that he's skeptical of the dichotomous categorization of majority and minority, and I'm only talking about that because I will be a little bit on the defensive because I use these, right? But I want to just say that I use them as a shorthand. Yeah. I find majoritarian particularly useful for the project that states are doing, and not only states, but, but institutions, right, are doing it's a, the majoritarian project. And, and I, I, I do find that analytically very useful. And in some contexts, that's a white project or, right? So, so I, think, I think if we put it out there, then at least uh, we signal that there are ways in which the institutions and the policies and the rules that structure our lives are designed and you know, um, reproduced in ways that are for some people more marked than for others. And for those who are part or situated more easily in the majoritarian project, that makes them be more members of that and less, um, their presence is less marked than it is for others. So that's how I'm using it. So that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, yeah, yes, thank you. No, I totally, I wasn't. <laughs> I, I, I mean, major, among other things, majority is not only an analytical category, it is also a category practice. And there are people who, who make claims reactive because claims are made in the name of minorities, claims are made in the name of majorities, it's become a practical category as well. Uh, and I think it's quite correct to speak of majoritarianism. And, and in my work on populism, I've emphasized that um, majoritarianism is actually a characteristic uh, trope in, in it's part of the it's a key part of the populist repertoire right that because there's something arithmetic about populism and its numerical conception of the people as the majority which isn't necessarily marked racially but it may be but there even a part even in context where it isn't there is something majoritarian about it and so yes I, I majoritarianism is is a very important concept there's been more work on this you know much better than I more work on majority nationalism and so on in recent years and, 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 and uh, uh, the like. About the you know, object reflexivity, uh, I mean, about categories of practice and categories of analysis, you're, yes, this is a very old and very long problem in the social sciences. It, uh, it's been more discussed in anthropology than, than other disciplines, but obviously very important in sociology for a very, very, very long time. There are different ways of talking about this categories of practice, categories of analysis, uh, folk categories and analytical categories, you know, lay categories, you know, whatever you want. Um, but yes, of course, it's a you know, constitutive aspect of social science that we deal with what Bourdieu himself once called an object that talks, right? An objet qui parle. Uh, and an object that talks, uh, you know, the, the talk is part of our data, but it's, all, yeah. So what do you do with that talk? And you know, you obviously, you don't ignore it, but uh, you, uh, you know, you, you need to, you can't either, in my view, I remain a Bourdieuian in that respect, you can't either simply appropriate it as your analytical language. I'm um, quite apart from the question of what it is and how it gets produced and who claims to be making claims in the name of you know, various other parties. Yes, sorry, Margaret. Yeah. 
Thank you, Rogers. Thank you, Zuzia. We have, meanwhile, received two more questions. Sure. Oh, three, actually. And one of them, one of them I would, uh, I would uh, ask Jord to answer. Uh, may I ask you, Jord, whether you see the questions? Uh, uh, the one about the Polish populi populists, uh, would that be possible for you to answer? You could do this together uh, with answering or entering uh, in, in, the, uh, in the debate concerning the other questions which were answered uh, by Rogers. So please answer the question and react, Rogers. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, this question is about um, uh, radicalism in East and, and Central Europe. It says that, yeah, basically this is a question do you think that this Eastern European radicalism will have long time consequences? And it's referring to a, a, a contestation movement in, in Poland where extreme right uh, populism uh, accused uh, the governing party of, of listening to Bill Gates. Yeah, well, I, 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 I share this concern. I think that uh, uh, populism is, is, is a difficult concept and, and uh, um, uh, and sometimes it's, it, it, it's a, it has very negative connotations, but I think that radicalism might be a more, uh, is a greater danger to put it a very, very simply, uh, to put it very simply in, in our region. Uh, because I think that, that I am more and more convinced that, um, well, this is not a great idea, but uh, uh, I just realize more and more as a political scientist that indeed, uh, democracy, a liberal democracy is of course not just dependent on, on institutions, but very much on behavior or what we may call culture or political culture, which was a, a, a very important topic of political science in the 60s, but somehow since then it, it, it faded away. But I think it's, it's, it's very important. We can see this also in, in the US, I, I believe that the institutional uh, setting is the same, but, but American politics with the extreme polarization radicalization and, and even uh, populism becoming mainstream is very different from, from, from American politics uh, from, from a couple of years ago. And I think this is happening in Eastern Europe as well. Uh, populism and also radicalization, which, which, are, which are becoming the mainstream, which are becoming the mainstream. And maybe I can, I can link this question to the question of majoritarianism. And also we have a question about the Roma in, in, in Eastern Europe. So, so uh, in this, populist uh, radicalism, which is becoming mainstream in Eastern Europe, uh, there is also a growing sense of, of, of majoritarian approach or, 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 or ideology, which is more and more hostile towards minorities. And, and I think that this, this poses problems, not, not because as me as a citizen, I am, I, am, I am worried about this, I am as a citizen, but I, I believe that uh, 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 it, it endangers and undermines the, in, in the social integration, the integrity of the society. And uh, on the longer term or even in, in medium term, I think it's just bad for the society. And, and I could go on, 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 on this topic uh, for, for much longer, but I will stop here. So, so, so I, I think that there is, there is a danger of, of, of radical populism becoming mainstream in, in Eastern Europe, but also in other countries. Thank you, thank you. They have a couple of minutes. Rogers, would it be possible to conclude uh, what you would like to say and uh, answer at the same time two questions which we received? One is concerning gendered symbolism of uh, the populist discourse. And the other one, the last one is about media uh, and with reference uh, to Turkey uh, but certainly you can also use your uh, U.S. examples concerning populist discourse and the media. Yeah, uh, I mean, let me just also say, for, let me first of all thank you for um, uh, organizing this, this event and thank everybody for their uh, terrific questions and contributions and commentaries. I can just touch briefly on a few of these questions. There was another one you didn't mention, you know, is it true that populism has no content I, uh, it's always relational and oppositional. I think, yes, it is true. If you look in the longer term historical perspective, you see it on the right and the left. You see it being protectionist and anti-neoliberal. You see it 
the, uh, you know, in, in being agrarian and urban. So uh, yes, I think populism is, is, is not an ideology like liberalism or socialism uh, or conservatism. It is an, an oppositional stance that draws characteristically on um, uh, anti-elite and anti-establishment rhetoric. Um, on the gendered imagery, there's a, a you know, the a questioner noted that yes, the machismo style is well known. What else is there? Um, you know, it's a big topic, but just in this present context, I do think um, you know, the gendered imagery is really very um, important in the cultural politics of mask wearing and notions of who wants to wear a mask and who doesn't, not only because of some sense of, okay, I'm going to be, you know, I don't, I want to be machismo, but just in some kind of characteristically male stance of not wanting this on while women are trying to be more protecting of, I mean, there's certainly that kind of discourse out there. And there's the representation of of the people as kind of in masculist terms, the representation of the people. So there's a gendering of the elite people opposition the, in, the, in the context of a politics of protectionism. The, the people are represented as it were more masculinely tough, you know, not needing so much protection. The elite are soft, coddled, et cetera. So I, th I think you see a lot of implicit gendered imagery there. On the um, media question, the questioner noted that um, uh, you know, we have the mass media and then social media and social media, of course, in recent decades have taken on a lot more importance, but mass media remain important, obviously in Hungary, um, uh, in Turkey, where they're controlled by government, etc. And in the US, I mean, yes, social media are crucial. Many of us spend too much time on social media. So you know, we forget that the mainstream media is out there and really was much more important in 2016 than, than Twitter was. But you know, uh, so yes, the mainstream media are, are, are crucial, uh, uh, but in this context, I think that social media during the pandemic have been a, a key site for the articulation and contesting of expertise. So it's really very interesting because of the temporality of, of social media. And you know, epidemiologists themselves are having very interesting Twitter conversations with one another about the latest developments, but they're not private because Twitter is not private. So anyone can jump in and does jump in and they claim to participate in these conversations between experts. So it's really very interesting to, and then they threaten the experts and they, and so on. So yes, thank you very much. This is the absolute last moment. Thank you for uh, our speaker, Rajas Brubaker, and for the two discussions, Zsuzsa uh, Csergő and uh, George Boda. It was an exciting discussion and the valorous contribution uh, from Rogers with your paper, which we hope to read very soon. Um, thank you, uh, stay safe and healthy, and goodbye.